Welcome to the two-year update on the Centropic Agroforestry Systems. I'll give you guys a quick reintroduction to who I am, what I'm doing here, the nature of this project, and then we'll dive into the details. We'll look at some observations, some learnings, some key lessons and mistakes, and iterative improvements that I've made over time in the new systems. So I'll do that at the very end, stick around, and you'll see some newer systems that have been planted in the last couple months, in the last year, because this is the oldest Centropic food forest area. This is really where a lot of those initial key learnings happened for me and I've been able to iteratively improve system design as I continue expanding out into the orchard. Because that's the idea here is basically I'm converting a small orchard that my family and I live on here in the Bay of Plenty, converting it from citrus, there's plums, avocados, persimmons, it's already quite diverse but there's still a lot of gaps, there's still a lot of open spaces, available space between trees and so now I'm working at retrofitting the existing orchard into high density diverse agroforestry systems and so this area here has been a fantastic template for learning and getting a lot of those observations to see what works well and what doesn't in this particular context. So that's what I'll be sharing a little bit about. We'll dive into the details of this system. You can see right here behind me, the eucalypts are approaching seven meters. And so that's gonna be the next job is tackling those emergent canopy layers, doing a really big, heavy prune in the next couple days. So what I'll do is I'll just walk around and share with you guys some observations. We'll go to different spots, see how we go. So if you don't already know me, my name is Byron. I live in New Zealand and I moved here about four or five years ago with my parents. And at this stage, I've really just been diving headfirst into and fully dedicating myself to learning about food forestry and agroforestry here in a New Zealand context. And that's what I spent all my time doing. I managed to quit my job two years ago. You might've seen a video at some stage. And this is what I do full time. I help people design and install food forest systems. I do a little bit of consulting. I manage the things here and basically just document and share the journey. And that's where a lot of this comes from. The passion I have for sharing this is to empower and inspire other people to do something similar. It's really fulfilling. It's one of the most, it feels like one of the most important things that I've like started doing in my life. It's really nourishing. It's felt like a really natural point to arrive at though, or to be passing through because my whole life I've been in this space of sharing and educating around ecology, environmental science. Um, it hasn't always been about growing food. That's a recent thing. This whole journey for me actually didn't start from a gardening or a food production perspective or background. I, I went to school for environmental science. That's kind of the nature that I grew up in. I grew up going to science camps and teaching at science camps, teaching at a nature center. And so that's really the environment that I come from, coming from Oregon, really outdoorsy place, beautiful natural environment to learn about and share. And so that's kind of where I come from is all the patterns throughout my life is basically just me being in a position of sharing and educating and just sharing that joy and passion with people. Um, that's been a big, big part of who I am and where I've kind of come from in this space. So it's exciting to notice those patterns and see how they still apply even today. And I'm at the point where I have a bunch of really amazing clients all around the country, all around the North Island that I've been helping with their food forest projects, whether that's just design work, whether that's installation work, small backyards, big paddocks, um, dairy farm conversions. So there's all sorts of different cool contexts to be applying food forest, agroforestry. So a little background on how I found out and how I kind of landed into this centropic agroforestry methodology or technique, rather than just kind of the conventional permaculture approach of guild planting or companion planting um, or just regular orchard. I didn't know anything about growing food when I first moved to New Zealand. It's only actually been in the last four years that I've really taken the steps to dive in and dedicate myself to learning about agroforestry. But like I said, it wasn't even from a place of, I wanna become an amazing gardener. It was really coming from a place of landscape regeneration and, and going to school for environmental science, seeing all the ecological problems, um, not just here in New Zealand, but globally. And the motivation really was figuring out what's a really compelling way to get people activated doing something about that, making a difference. Because in a lot of ways, sometimes it can feel like a burden if, if somebody says, oh, just go plant a bunch of native trees. A lot of people don't see the benefit of that because they don't see the tangible, what do I get out of it? people are selfish and people want to see direct benefits to them. So the spin on this that's been really amazing is it's landscape regeneration, but it's edible, but it's beneficial to the individual, to the family, to the community. So there's so many knock on effects of this, of, of this agroforestry, this entropic agroforestry methodology that I've found work really beautifully to bring people together, whether it's if you're from a gardening or, a, an, or an orcharding or a food growing background, or in my case, like an ecological regeneration background, right? Turning acres and acres of, de you know, of degraded slopes or gullies into really 
ecologically sound ecosystems that are also productive. So that's kind of my, my introduction to this. And I first started learning about permaculture maybe almost four years ago, maybe, almost, yeah, almost four years ago, I started learning about permaculture and kind of went through that sequence of learning about permaculture. And then it kind of upgraded to companion planting when I moved here, because I was learning about, I was trying to figure out how do I apply permaculture to an existing orchard. And so I first kind of started by just interplanting individual fruit trees between the existing trees. Um, and then that they just got swamped with the grass. They just got totally overgrown. And so then I started, okay, learning about companion planting, tried that, I saw a big benefit in that. But then I went to Permadynamics, which is the oldest syntropic food forest here in New Zealand, I think around 17 or 18 years old. Did a weekend long workshop course with them and just came back so inspired. So that's really where a lot of this syntropic agroforestry stuff began and just started getting stuck in really. And that it hasn't stopped since then. I've continued the learning with the Agroforestry Academy, doing hours and hours and hours of online research, um, but also in-person research, going to different food forest sites here around the country, meeting people, seeing what works in certain situations, different strategies. And that's one of the best ways to learn I've noticed is just go see other people's sites, go make observations, go talk to people and see what their successes were, see what they didn't have success with. It's such a fantastic way of learning that I cannot recommend enough. And that's gonna start informing how you begin to design your own spaces. And now I'm at the point where I'm fortunate enough to be able to design for clients and to do installations for clients. And that even in itself is kind of like getting the reps in, going through that design process for a bunch of different contexts and a bunch of different iterations. It just builds your capacity, it builds your skill as a designer, so couldn't recommend that enough if you're at all interested in the space. Here you can see one of the recent additions to this area. We've done a plantain circle. So these are the edible cooking plantains surrounded in Mexican sunflower, deep pit, tons of mulch. The evolution has been from permaculture, companion planting, and then into centropic agroforestry. And that's kind of where things are at now is finding that mix between context appropriate design. So kind of living design process, holistic decision-making, plus centropic agroforestry, basically figuring out what is your exact context and what kind of system is gonna be just right for you because not everybody needs a full centropic system like this one. I don't think this would suit many people because this is my context. My context is so utterly unique. You wouldn't wanna copy these systems because they're so unique to my own personal context. That's why it's important to dive into what is it that you are trying to accomplish. So let's take a look at some of the details of these systems now. So one of the main things that separates syntropic agroforestry from more conventional permaculture, companion planting or orchard, essentially the, the use of succession in pioneer species. And if you're paying attention, you've seen some of those pioneer species around just as I've been walking around. One of the major ones here is Mexican sunflower or Tithonia diversifolia. It's a fantastic high nitrogen, really rich organic material chop and drop. You can prune it multiple times in the growing season. This is another species. It's an acacia, nitrogen fixing, grows wild here. Fantastic early support species, chop and drop, you can see, doing fantastic job of creating that emergent canopy layer, sheltering and protecting the tamarillo, hovering above the banana, so, and pruning all that organic material down. And basically, the, the way that I like to imagine it is your job in an agroforestry system, especially a centropic agroforestry system, is you are orchestrating an ecosystem's development through time and the management is a huge part of that the management is essentially you coming in as as a force of nature right what ordinarily would have been a windstorm breaking branches breaking trees down opening canopy allowing new things to emerge you are becoming the windstorm and you're doing that job manually with sicketeers with pruning saws with machetes and you're the one you can see making cuts right here deliberate pruning to open sunlight into the canopy and allow for those transitions of more long-term edible species to rise up through. So it's a transition that you are, you're helping to manage that ecological transition from what starts off as a grassland into early pioneer species and eventually into long-lived perennial food crops. You can see here's an avocado right next to the support species, Mexican sunflower, helping to remove that kaikuyu as well. The idea is that these short-term pioneer species help quickly accelerate that succession away from grass. Right? Grass is an absolute nightmare for a lot of these fruit trees, especially the kaikuyu that we have here. And so the shade that the Mexican sunflower casts on top of 
the organic material that you're trapping and dropping and dumping down um, on top of chemical hormones in the soil, right? All of these factors contribute to quickly accelerating away from grassland into a highly productive edible ecosystem. And you can see, with just being two years old, this ecology is already quite developed. Orchestrating an ecosystem's development over time and you as a manager are really just there to help accelerate that succession, right? Accelerate that ecological succession with timely pruning, timely management, organization of the organic material as well. You can see I've just come through yesterday and just cut all the tall grass that was in these access rows. I cut them with the brush cutter, I cut the grass, and then that's gonna be part of organizing the material. That's part of the management is organizing the material. So I'll be raking that over onto the edges of those tree rows, and that's gonna allow the grass to decompose, smother any potential grass that creeps into the rows. Because you know when you mow your grass and you leave a pile of grass on the lawn, it kills the lawn underneath. You're basically using that same principle here, but along a whole edge of your tree line. That's why the, the beauty of planting things in straight lines is that it makes things very efficient and very easy to manage. You chop your organic material and you know exactly where to lay it so you're not gonna smother or crush any seedlings. And then you have a really straightforward way to manage your species and scale things up. Rather than having things offset and having just a jungle where it's really difficult to manage, you wanna be able to manage things effectively. If you can scale this up by making it really simple to manage, that's the key. And so all of my tree systems are in straight lines now. That's one of the major learnings is even staggering trees, I don't do it. I plant everything in a straight line so then it's very simple and easy to manage the organic material onto those edges. Some of the other support species that you might have noticed in here, we've got acacia, a few different varieties. We've got poplar and willow in here for a beautiful mycorrhizal association. They're bridge species between A, B, and A, AR, I think, different kinds of fungal associations. Um, we've also got tree lucerne right here. And these ones are just fantastic nitrogen fixers, especially if you're on sandier soils. Um, the native wood pigeons, the kedidu, love them. And also they can get citrus borer. They can be affected by citrus borer later in life. Part of that is, I, I'm not worried about that entirely because in a lot of ways, they're gonna exit the system after the first handful of years, um, but it is still something to consider. You can see in this second row that I did, this is actually one year old. So all of these rows are two years old. This row here is newer, it's one year old. The biggest difference that I made between the new row and the old row is the density of support species. You can see in this tree row here, you can see the eucalypts are only placed about every four meters, and that was not enough especially after learning about how dense you can actually plant eucalypts from the Agroforestry Academy. In this row, I've planted them at every single meter. So one meter intervals, I've planted a eucalyptus. One meter intervals between that, I've planted a tree lucerne. Tree lucerne right here, and then right next to it is a eucalypt. And with the eucalyptus, I went different varieties. I went, I, I trialed a bunch, maybe four different varieties in here just to see what would work. I didn't want to commit fully to one. So we've got mitins in here, we've got the Ovata, this is the Viminalis. So there's a few different trials just to see what works because I know that I'm still in the early stages of it. Another thing that's a little bit different about this row is I've got a lot more organic material on both sides. On the front edge, we kind of consistently have the Mexican sunflower as a hedge and you can see, it's pretty much as tall as me now. I'm gonna need to cut this probably tomorrow or later today. On the south side of this row, we've got Queensland arrowroot as a biomass crop. It's almost hard to understand, but because what you're looking at is just a bunch of Mexican sunflower. It's a bunch of really early succession species, right? You can see the bananas. You can see the eucalypt, you can see the tree lucerne, but you can't actually see the diversity of all the fruit trees that are in here. That's because they're all in the understory, right? They're all happily growing in really sheltered conditions slowly, right? They're being protected from the really intense sunlight. They're getting that protection from any heavy winds. And that's part of the importance of coming through on a regular basis and doing that pulse pruning, that those regular interventions to allow that sunlight in. Because a few things happen when you're pruning. One thing that happens is you're creating a sunlight well, the new sunlight comes in, and all those species in the understory kind of begin fighting for that space. They begin crawling up to the canopy to capture that sunlight. So the second thing that happens when you're pruning is you're dropping that organic material down onto the forest floor, right? That's increasing the soil moisture, that's inviting the soil biology to come up, and we all know that soil biology is the key to nutrient availability in plants. So that's the second thing that happens. The third thing that happens is when you're pruning, once you prune, the growth hormone goes crazy. I think it's called gibberellin, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but that growth hormone that, uh, that a plant experiences when it gets a heavy prune to regrow a bunch, that plant hormone is shared 
across the neighboring plants. And so when you're pruning, all the tree species in the understory, they're gonna experience an increase in that growth hormone. You'll see a surge of growth. One more thing that's happening is when you're pruning your nitrogen fixers, you can see here how I'm pruning these tree lucerne and keeping them really nice and open. Just at the top, there's foliage, and I'm taking about 90% of these foli the foliage off of these tree lucerne when I'm pruning them. I'm pruning them really aggressively. Here's another example, really aggressive pruning on the tree lucerne, and making pretty big cuts. You can see up here and here, like I'm, I'm taking a lot of the tree canopy out and dropping that down into the tree rows, allowing that sunlight to come up. You can see here's a fig under there, there's a mulberry. The thing that's happening with the tree lucerne and the acacia, the nitrogen fixers, when you're pruning your nitrogen fixers, they're also dumping a huge amount of nitrogen into the ground when you're pruning. On top of the nitrogen that comes from the actual foliage, the nitrogen fixing bacteria that are attached in colonies to the roots, when the roots shed, because when you prune them, the tree balances out, the roots shed and all that nitrogen or a portion of it becomes available to the nearby plants. And so you can imagine that when you're pruning things at scale, on mass, in these big pruning events, which I'll do soon, there's so many things that are happening. The soil moisture is retained because you're dropping other organic material down. The exposed sunlight wells allows all these young seedlings and all those young trees to pump up. The growth hormone that's shared by everything gives everything a beautiful boost. On top of all the nitrogen fixing trees, there's just so many benefits and all the earthworms come up, the soil is covered. That's one of the biggest things in Centropic Agroforestry is keeping your soil covered. That's probably one of the most important principles that exist with Centropic Agroforestry is keeping your soil covered and growing enough organic material to accomplish that. And that's one of the biggest learnings for me is planting enough organic material, especially in advance. If you can plant your organic material, your biomass crops in advance of the actual edible species, do it. There's no reason why you have to plant your edibles and then your biomass species. That's one thing that I've been taking away and learning for the newest systems as I'm converting slowly more and more of this orchard is I'm starting to plant more of the biomass crops ahead of time, just as an early succession pioneer before I even go plant edible species. I'm also experimenting with a few different varieties of bananas. Here we've got a gold finger, we're trying some plantains, the blue java, regular lady fingers, dwarf cavendish, we're trying a diversity of bananas because it's still quite marginal here. It's still, we're still very early. We have slightly cold winters. We get a little bit of frost every year, just a handful of frost events. And so that's part of the beauty is that I, the agroforestry system now is repelling the frost. I'll show you some footage comparing the first year to the second year and how that microclimate has developed. But really it's a fantastic thing to see such positive feedback from. And I'm noticing some of the banana varieties, like the Goldfingers, for example, seem to actually handle the cold temperatures a little bit better. They respond, they rebound in spring a little bit quicker than the Ladyfingers and the Cavendish especially. The beauty of trialing different varieties of things when you're early is just seeing what works well for your particular climate. You don't wanna just fully invest in one thing and then realize, you know, two years down the road after a big investment, oh, maybe we should have gone higher diversity. So that's one of my biggest recommendations is go get high diversity, find plant material from all over the place. Don't just get all your plant material from one specific source. And that's that's part of the beauty of it is it just allows you to travel around, make connections, meet new people. It's, it's a really fun process in and of itself is collecting plant material to incorporate into agroforestry systems, so. Hopefully that was interesting for you. It's been a fantastic learning journey. There's so much joy that I experienced from like managing and watching these systems grow and planting new systems, which we'll take a look at in a second, but it's just been one of the most fulfilling things. I, I never would have imagined. It's actually been one of the biggest surprises to me is I never actually, I didn't anticipate how emotional it would make me feel, how, how much of a really just a satisfying experience this was going to be. I didn't realize it was going to create such a strong connection to the land here. I kind of just thought as, of it as a surface level of like, oh, I'll just plant a food forest. But very quickly, I've realized that it develops such a strong, like very deep emotional connection with the land here, a long-term vision. It feels like you kind of start tapping into what that ancient human ancestry is of connecting with the landscape and and knowing things on a deeper level, you begin reading plants, you begin to gain this literacy, this language of plants and listening to them and listening to the ecosystem. It's this really beautiful thing that it, you'll know if you have a food forest or if you're managing a system like this, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but it's really, really satisfying, so. And this is the newest system that was installed just a couple months ago. And this is probably one of my favorite systems. It's got the most iterative improvements and I'll just give you a quick rundown and I'll probably do a longer video um, in the near future. But basically 
one of the biggest lessons here, one of the biggest improvements I've made is a lot more early succession biomass, early succession herbaceous biomass and less tree density. So the other system from last year, really high tree density, like all the tree looser and the eucalypt. This one, lower tree density, higher herbaceous, like grass, biomass, um, the, got the bana grass in here, the sugar cane, there are eucalypts, there are other bananas. There's more Mexican sunflower as well, but there's just way more herbaceous, early succession organic material, rather than such a high emphasis on the tree species. So you can see, again, really high density. We've got citrus in here, we've got papaya, long-term stuff like the cherry moyas, inga beans, white sapote, um, a few different banana varieties. But again, emphasis on the early succession grass, organic material, the Mexican sunflower, the bananas, um, this tree line was established last year, so that's doing really nicely. It's going to help shelter things. But again, early succession, that's that's kind of the emphasis now. Um, that's the biggest takeaway is the early succession biomass is super, super important. I'll do a more thorough walkthrough of this system in the next couple months, but hopefully that was an interesting walkthrough of the two-year-old systems and a bit of insight into some of the newer stuff. Hope that you enjoyed that, got a lot of value out of it, and we'll see you soon.